Really excited to be interviewing Dr. Joe Feingold today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, I know that you have just an amazing you know, history of helping so many families. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are currently in your practice and, and why you got involved? So I live in Suffolk, New York, which is about 45 minutes north of New York City. And I am practicing, I have a private practice where I treat children with special needs. And I also have an urgent care center. Um, and it's a pediatric urgent care center. And this is because my background is actually pediatric emergency medicine. And I was the assistant director of a busy pediatric emergency room in the Bronx until I had my daughter. My daughter uh, had brain damage at birth. And unfortunately, no other mainstream modality was making any kind of impact in her life until I started to do hyperbaric oxygen. And that gave her a voice. So then I changed the, I changed the way I was doing things, and I opened up a practice With, to help more families like your daughter. Help. Well, you know, what happens is you become so excited to see changes when you didn't see anything before. Now, we did a lot of PTOTs, you know, early intervention. I had people in and out of my house five days a week. But still, I wasn't seeing much. And so I became very frustrated. Not because of any other reason than if my daughter couldn't tell me that she was soiled or that she was in pain or that somebody touched her, somebody didn't treat her kindly, that was the, the, the real difficult thing for me as a mother to accept. I don't know if my daughter was hurting. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you become it becomes the new normal. Like you have a child with special needs. Your life changes into rails. So I have five children, and so for the others, I could tell by their pain. They would talk to me. They would they would let me know if they were unhappy. And Lisa couldn't, and that became really heartbreaking for me. So the fact that she got a voice, that she got to tell me one of her first sentences, we laugh about it, is she said, "Susan is stupid." Why is Susan stupid? Susan was her aide in school. And she said, put floor, bumped head. I'm like, oh, <laughs> now I know that she so so that was that was so um, it made me so happy because finally she could tell me that somebody wasn't kind to her, or someone could hurt her. And I think that that is one of the most important things for any parent. We all want neurotypical children. Yes. I, if I could go back in time and have a completely neurotypical child, I would give anything, including my life. And I'm not the only parent. I think uh, many of us, all of us, yes. are in the same yeah. boat. We all say, God, please let me die knowing that my child will be taken care of. We can't die. I can't die yet because my daughter doesn't walk. And she's not independent. So we all have the same feeling. Short of getting a completely neurotypical child, then what do we settle for? We, 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 it's not settling. We want the best possible life for our child. So a child who is speaking, who's communicating, is much better off than a child who's not. A child who doesn't have chronic diarrhea is much better off than one that does. A child who doesn't have a bloated stomach or a bloated abdomen, a child who is able to sleep at night. We're not, I always tell patients, I don't have a magic wand. And we don't go like this and all your problems go away. But if I can make a small difference in the quality of life of that person, and their family, I think I've accomplished my goal. Absolutely, and and I I know we, I know some of your history is in the ER, and yes. I know as families and as parent, as a mother myself, 
one of my biggest fears, I mean, we have so many fears, you know, as you mentioned, but one of my biggest fears is, oh my gosh, when my child gets sick or maybe he gets injured and now I have to go to the ER because that's what we do, right? And when you go to the ER, it's so chaotic. It's so sensory overloading. And as a parent, you're already kind of freaked out about your child saying, okay, how do you make sure they're okay? And now I have to deal with ER. What tips can you give families out there for those kind of situations that they can then say, okay, Dr. Joe said to do this, this, and this? Well, I think the first thing is to research the area where you live and see if there is a pediatric emergency department which is separate from an adult emergency room. And that is because most pediatricians that do ER medicine, they work in environments that are really child friendly. So they have things, including nebulizers, they're in the form of animals, they're brightly colored with all kinds of things that would distract a child. We, I know in our urgent care center, I have uh, monitors that they can be watching cartoons or their favorite. We have iPads that they can watch one of their favorite shows so they can calm down. Plus, emergency medical doctors that treat adults have one type of mindset. Pediatricians have another. And they really tend to calm the child down and to, to put the family at ease. Also, this is a very important factor. You know, when I first graduated medical school and started training in pediatrics, the numbers of children with autism were so few that none of us were really trained to, to interact with children with autism with their families. However, the numbers didn't start going up until 1991. So if we saw one or two children every few months, that was a lot. Now, we get to see a lot more. And so if you go to a pediatric emergency room or a pediatric urgent care center that specializes in children, most of them will have, uh, have had experience dealing with children on the spectrum. And if you mention it to them immediately, they know that these children can become violent if they're you know, overloaded, sensory overloaded. They'll know to put them in a room, maybe quiet them down out of the whole emergency room waiting area so that they don't become uh, sensory overloaded. And you can tell them, can you just dim the lights? Most people now understand that. Is there a certain age um, in the pediatric urgent care that families need to know about? Like, is it 18 or is it 25? So it's usually 21. And 21? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then what about for adults? Um, I know for my son, he's 16, so he's still in the under 18 category. Um, however, just recently, he had a severe allergy to cashews. We didn't know. And I get a phone call, and all of a sudden, this child's swelling up. I call. They said, you need to take him to ER. My heart was like, oh, goodness gracious. The last thing I want to do is go to ER. I had found an urgent care center um, near us that I'd gone to personally that was very clean. They seemed to really understand. So I called them up, and I asked them, can we bring him in? here. Yes. Um, they, and luckily it was during business hours, so it worked out great. It wasn't one o'clock in the morning, you know, type of thing. So um, do you recommend families? That for us really helped because we got in right away. They were really wonderful. The doctor, we, we didn't have to wait in a waiting room. We were able to, they knew we were coming. Absolutely. I think urgent care centers should be used for that, for urgent cases. And a lot of them, most of our kids that look at uh, urgent cases, urgent care centers, they treat just that, fevers, rashes, uh, wheezing, and so they're, they're really well equipped and generally they're very clean mm -hmm. and they're also child friendly. So they, they, the waiting time is really minimal and they'll, they'll be able to put both parents and child at ease. And I love that. Um, do you have any recommendations um, for any paperwork that we might need to bring with us? Is there anything we need to keep on hand or give into a caregiver if we're not there? Um, I always recommend that if you leave your child you know, with someone, that you give them a notarized, I mean, you should have it on file, something that they can give, saying that they, that they have the authority to act in your 
we have. So, for example, you may have cases that are in the gray zone. If someone comes in in respiratory distress, if someone comes in with an arrhythmia, if someone comes in with a life-threatening or limb-threatening emergency, you don't ever have to worry. The doctor actually, by state law, assumes responsibility for that patient. So no matter who you send them with, we actually have to take over. But short of that, so for example, a minor cut, do you close, do you not close? An antibiotic for maybe an ear infection that is on the fence, um, you know, a minimal wheeze. These are things that we may not have the authority to intervene if your child doesn't have a caretaker saying that you've given them the okay. Okay. So that's something that's always good to have. The other thing which I think is always good to have is, is allergies. So any allergies, because, for example, a lot of children are on a ketogenic diet. If you're, if you're on a ketogenic diet, you may not want IV D5 given. So if we have to give fluids, we'll shy away from that. And we will understand there are some children that will have seizures if, if they're not on the diet. So these things, just a minimal you know, diagnosis, he's on the spectrum, he's on a special diet, and he's allergic to amoxicillin. That gives me a lot of information, then I know how to proceed. And I think that's so important because as a family, you know, with a child with special needs, you're already in that panic mode of trying to get your child to wherever that emergency situation is. So if you have that all prepared and all you have to do is grab the folder or the caregiver's there and all they have to do is grab the folder, that takes that that little bit of pressure absolutely off. So if families want to learn more about you, how, how do they do that? Do you have a website? Um, we're actually working on a new website because I had to rename my, my business just because I the structurally I'm changing things. Mm -hmm. So it's New York Hyperbaric Solutions where I concentrate mostly on hyperbarics, but we also do dietary intervention. I work with someone who does a lot of the functional part of, of uh, intervening with um, these children. And um, so New York Hyperbaric Solutions.com or you can call at, I, I'm actually one of those doctors who does answer. <laughs> I do, I do, I have a very small practice. Um, I raised five children so it was kind of difficult for me to um, to, to have a large practice. So our phone number is 845-536-4192, and usually we get back to you. That's wonderful. Now, if for those parents out there that maybe just got the diagnosis of autism recently, what kind of advice can you tell those parents? Well, the first thing I tell people is don't give up hope. You know, hope it, it, when people give up hope, you stop looking for any options and you start and you just decide that you're going to stay in that state. Just because someone gives you the diagnosis of cancer and they say, oh, you have two months to live, doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have two months to live. I know people who've survived eight years, ten years after they were given that diagnosis. So just because someone says, oh, your child has autism, you know, you don't throw your hands up in the air say, God, why'd you do this to me? And, and, and stop having any hope that things can change. There are things that I have seen in my professional life. I have seen miracles. I wish I had a major miracle with my daughter because I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I always say the minute she gets up out of her wheelchair, the minute she is capable of taking care of herself, this is a heart-wrenching business to be in because I identify with my parents. So the minute she's independent, God decides to, you know, snap my finger and she's completely fine. I'm out of here. However, lives can be changed and I've seen miracles happen. I've seen children who are given the diagnosis, sometimes even severe autism, change and and lose their diagnosis. I've had parents who've had to move from one school district to another 
without any kind of medical uh, diagnosis that would follow the child because they didn't want that for their child. So never lose faith. There are new therapies coming out every day. There are new interventions. And who knows, within our lifetime, we can see this disease completely resolved. I pray that that happens because, because it's such a devastating disease for, for the child, for the whole family for the siblings, for the extended family. So, you know, there were things, when, when I started medicine, one of the worst diagnoses that you could get was AIDS. It almost looked like, you know, AIDS was going to really destroy the generation. And we would fear the child who was diagnosed with AIDS, with double blood, and do this and do that. Now children, now human beings are surviving with AIDS and they are doing well. You can't tell who has AIDS and who doesn't. So maybe autism is the next one. It should be because right now it is an epidemic and I think the people like the ones that you will interview and soon and the, the people that like me that like decided to go into this breakthroughs will come through. It's beautiful and I, I'm right there with you and so all we can do is hope and never give up. So thank you so much, Dr. Joe. My pleasure. Thank you.